Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to the Scouse Science Podcast. My name is Professor Tom Solomon. I'm here at the University of Liverpool and I'm joined by two guests today, Sally Sheard and Frank Cottrell Boyce. Say hello, guys. Hi. Hi. Okay, and through the wonders of Zoom, we also have lots of people joining us. Um, but the first thing I'm going to get you all to do is uh, modify your Zoom slightly so that you can see the three of us a bit more clearly. Uh, those who are uh, not very familiar with Zoom, I'll talk you through it slowly. You'll see a box in the middle, uh, lots of boxes with people's names on. And if you go to any box with somebody's name on, I'm doing Jamie Box. He's not called Jamie Box because he's in a box. Uh, there's a little thing in the corner with three dots. And if you click on the three dots and then you see a drop down menu and you click hide non-video participants. And if you do that now, all the boxes will disappear and you'll just be left with the three of us. So, good. Let's assume most people have done it. Great. There we are. Hi, guys. Have you done it, Frank? Have you done it, and Sally? I have, yeah. I'm going to miss yeah. those little guys, but yeah. Now you, you two, of course, are old hands at Zoom. I will say, people can send us messages. So if you're struggling to do it and want a personalised instruction through the chat about how to do it, send a message on the on the chat function of Zoom, and uh, and someone will help you. And also, uh, this is being uh, streamed live by Facebook. So people can send in messages by Facebook or via the chat function. And we're really interested to hear your comments, your questions. So do send them through to us. So this is the first Scouse Science podcast. And we thought it'd be fun to get together one of our great scientists at the University of Liverpool and one of our famous faces locally and have a chat. So that's exactly what we're going to do. Um, first of all, let me allow them to introduce themselves. So Sally, first of all, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm Sally Sheard. I'm... Um... How to start? I'm a health policy historian. I'm head of the Department of Public Health Policy and Systems at the University of Liverpool, and I'm the Andrew Geddes and John Rankin Chair of Modern History. Fantastic, thanks. And Frank? Hi, I'm Frank Gottschall Boyce. I'm a children's writer and a film writer. Okay. Great, brilliant. Now, again, <laughs> just before we start, we'd like everyone to, so we know the chat function is working, just send us in a chat message about where you're listening from. We're quite interested in where people are, are hearing us from. So let us know where you are, maybe even what you're up to. Now, Zoom, uh, love it, hate it, uh, but it, it's the only way we can operate at the moment. And this is our first podcast together. But I was going to ask you both, what's your favourite podcast or what's the weirdest podcast you've come across? Sally first. Um, I listen to two on a regular basis, This American Life and The Memory Palace, both of which I'd highly recommend. Memory Palace is brilliant, um, really short episodes. There was one they did a few weeks ago, which was called Stories to Wash Your Hands By, 20 minutes, 20 second stories. Absolutely fantastic. Great. OK, we'll look out for those. And Frank, any podcasts you'd like to recommend or suggest we avoid? I, <laughs> I I listen to This American Life as well. I also use the Duolingo podcasts, which are great, really helpful. And of late, since lockdown, I've become completely addicted to the More or Less podcast and its daughter podcast. They're both done by Tim Hartford, which is uh, 50 Things That Made the Modern World. Right, great. Well, lots of things for us all to listen to there. But anyway, let's get on with our own podcast today. I, for, for, for what it's worth, the ones I like are Louis Theroux. Have you listened to that one? Oh, yeah. Lo yeah, yeah. Locked yeah. at Home with Louis Theroux. And um, the, uh, the uh, coronavirus newscast uh, on BBC with um, uh, the Laura Koonsberg and others. And I've, I've appeared on that a couple of times as well, which was actually where I, I got the idea that this would be quite good fun to do. OK, so let's start with Sally. Anyway, um, you are our scientist today. Now, most people, uh, when they think of science, they think of people in white coats in laboratories and uh, you're a social scientist. And I was quite keen to get you on the first one because uh, I know it can be quite irritating, irritating that wet science, lab science is the only thing people ever think of. So tell us a little bit more about what it, what it is to be a social scientist, what it means. Well, I, I think you've, you've started off on the right tack. Absolutely, Tom. Thank you very much. Uh, so modern science has three branches. There's natural sciences, social sciences and formal sciences. And people talk about science as just being the default is always it's natural science. It's biology, chemistry, physics. It's the stuff that my son does in his wet lab 
in Leeds wearing his white coat. It's the stuff you do, Tom, in your labs. Social science um, is the study of societies and it is a, an equally important part. You cannot have one branch of science without having the others. You need all three legs of that tripod if you're going to have good knowledge. And that's what science means. It's the Latin word for knowledge. So social sciences, the sorts of terms that people will come across are sociology, psychology, economics, geography, and history. So I'm a history scientist. Um, my colleagues, if they're listening, they'll be a bit puzzled if you're introducing me as a scientist, because it's not a word that's often associated with history. And what, so you talked about how important it is to have these different strands and how important the social sciences to uh, I guess, ensure delivery of, of, of things that are learnt in labs and, and in wards and hospitals. What, where, when it doesn't work out, give us examples where things have not, you know, happened like they might have done because the social scientists weren't involved as they, as they could have been or should have been. Because it's all, the truth is, for, for most of us scientists, I mean, I'm just about getting the hang of the kind of things you do. And that's why I was very keen to, to get you on first. But, you know, if most of us are still struggling. Give us examples of where it's done well or done badly. Well, we talked about this um, back in January when we launched the Centre of Excellence for Infectious Diseases Research in Liverpool. And I gave a presentation then and I said um, epidemics are not just biological. They're political, they're social, they're economic, they're, they're cultural. And I think if you look back at how we've handled epidemics, pandemics in the past, you will see the, the absence of social science in the policy responses to those so they bring in the, the traditional scientists um, from biology. Uh, they do um, transmission modelling of viruses. But what they don't do automatically is bring in the social scientists at the same time. So that's, that's where we need to get better. I think that's what we can do with, with COVID-19. We're beginning to see that happening. Yeah. So I was going to ask you about that. I mean, we're in the middle of this pandemic um, what have you been doing? What's been different for you and how, how have you been helping address some of the problems with the pandemic? Well, my usual research projects are around the interface between policymakers and expert advisors. So this is perfect territory for me. And quite quickly after we realised that this was going to be something that would run for weeks, well, we were thinking weeks or months then, um, we put in a funding request to get funding to do a study on the policy dynamics of COVID-19. So that's one piece of work that I'm doing alongside the day job. The other thing I'm doing, which is absolutely fascinating, and it's a real privilege, is I'm working very closely with Matt Ashton, who is the Director of Public Health for Liverpool City Council. And traditionally, we had very close relationship between universities and local authorities when it came to public health and we're beginning to rebuild that in Liverpool. And what I'm doing with Matt is I'm co-chairing a health intelligence group and making sure that we get the best intelligence through from all types of science into that local COVID response. And what, what difference is that making in practical terms? What does that mean is happening that might not otherwise be happening? It means that we are able to access all of the expertise we have locally in universities, not just Liverpool, but more broadly, um, particularly around things like um, modelling of transmission of diseases. Uh, we're also able to access researchers who we have working in our communities on a regular basis and say to them, look, we'd really like to go into some households and understand um, local people's reactions, responses to COVID. Can you help us get that sort of access? Mm. So it's freeing up, I think, some of the ways in which we generate new knowledge within our city. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. I was thinking back to, you know, what trying to underscore the importance of social science. I suppose uh, pe people, I, you know, often hear it said that in terms of medical science, you know, if we just applied all the things we've already discovered, then... Uh, the world would be a much healthier place and that you know what tends to happen is there's all these great discoveries there's all these clinical projects there's all this lab science and in a sense we know uh, you know we know what we need to do it's just and the social science helps us do it you know we know how to reduce lung cancer we just need to stop people smoking uh, there's so many examples of that and, and and in some respects social science is is trying to make sure we apply some of the things we're learning do, is that a reasonable summary would you say 
it, it needs to go both ways. We need to apply lessons from social science and natural science and, and vice versa. Um, policy making is a really messy business. That it's not a linear, natural thing that happens. You don't just get the evidence and then you get the, the policy. If you look at something like smallpox eradication, so they discovered in 1798 how to um, prevent smallpox. And it took nearly 200 years for smallpox to be eradicated worldwide. Uh, that's, that's a really good example of where you've got the knowledge, but how do you mobilise that knowledge? We, we see that in so many different environments. Um, so the best policy is the policy that is informed by all types of science, social science and natural science. Fantastic, thanks. Frank, what have you been doing since the, uh, since the lockdown began? Or since um, the outbreak began, the pandemic began? Um, in a profound way, it's no change to me because as my next door neighbour, your friend said to me when I first moved in, so you've condemned yourself to a, a lifetime of homework. Um, oh. And I've had this kind of weird inversion where actually because of the lockdown, I'm actually more accessible to people because normally geography is a good way of pushing people away, saying, you know, no, I can't come to Los Angeles because of this, or no, I can't go and visit your school in Southampton because it's too far away. And suddenly everybody, I'm very, very accessible. Kind of one thing that, you know, crosses over with Sally is that at the very beginning of lockdown, I was talking about whether writers would want to write about the pandemic or not, mm. because in a weird way, like you always write about something exceptional and the pandemic is happening to everybody. So we're all having that experience and that's kind of democratic, but kind of weird as well. And somebody said to me, but you've already written a book about a pandemic, which I'd completely forgotten that I wrote a book called The Astounding Broccoli Boy a few years ago, which is about a viral pandemic in which two children are the heroes. And, and so I decided to read that on, on Instagram as a kind of Jack and Ori thing. Um, like one thing that writers can do and what lots of writers and illustrators have done is provide like free online creative writing. I've been doing creative writing lessons because I'm kind of aware of people who don't have gardens and how difficult it is to entertain your children if you don't have a garden. So I thought I can do this. So I was doing creative writing lessons and I was Jack and Orying this story. And it was really, really interesting to see what you could imagine and what I had imagined, which was incredibly accurate. There was lots of lockdown, London was empty. There was even sections about animals coming back into gardens and stuff like this, but also what you couldn't imagine, mm. you know, uh, what, what's unimaginable and what is imaginable. And I think the crossover with Sally is that when you're talking about policy, the greatest policy tool, the most powerful policy tool is narrative, you know, and uh, right at the beginning, so it's policy is a mixture of law, scientific innovation, but also of news, which is narrative. So right at the very beginning of this lockdown, we had images that were very familiar of panic buying and all that stuff. And they kind of seemed to be like the beginning of 28 Days Later or Contagion, a narrative that we're very used to, which is that, you know, society is a veneer. If you break the veneer, we'll all end up eating each other in two weeks. And then there was another narrative that came in very, very quickly, which is like neighbours, rainbows and windows, WhatsApp groups in, in which technology became a very, very important part of that. And that there was, there seemed to be kind of middle eight of the pandemic where there was greater social cohesion than ever. Mm. That people were shopping for each other, were more aware of each other. I think quite an interesting thing took place with regard to kind of online, which is that I think the word community had begun to shift meaning from your, ge your geographical location into your interest group. You know, that like mm. community was the people that you had to live cheek by jowl with, whether you liked them or not. You know, and as a Catholic, I'm in a parish with people that I've got nothing else in common with, but the physical, the fact that we see each other at least once a week, you know, and that we're very, very different from each other. And community was coming to mean something which was a group of people online who all believe exactly the same thing. And if one of them deviates even a little bit, they get cancelled. And there was kind of a reversion to a more geographical sense of community. And then I think over the last few weeks, as people have realized that actually we're not all in this together, uh, I think culturally the Cummings thing, however trivial it, the incident in itself was, has been a bit of a turning point in terms of the, the, the national mood and the, and the narrative. I think the narrative is very, very important. The, the power of 
the Blitz spirit narrative, for instance, however dubious that is historically, was very, very useful in the middle. So I think the stories that we tell each other become very, very, very important. And who's telling those stories is important. And narrative as a tool of policy is something that I've thought about a lot. I think who's telling the stories is, is a really significant issue. And I think we've seen a lot of um, a lot of interest during this pandemic about who is fronting uh, the, the government's response and when they're choosing to put up political uh, people like ministers and when they're choosing to put up their, their scientific experts such as Tom. I wonder, Tom, have you got any views on, on that? Well, I, actually, there's a few things I, that Frank's mentioned that I just wanted to look into a little bit more. And I will come back to that. I'm not dodging it. My brother, <laughs> every time I appear, he sends me terrible text messages afterwards saying, why don't you just answer the question? And he doesn't understand that you can answer the question, but you sometimes want to frame it a little bit in, into a, a context rather than just a simple yes or no. So I promise I'll come back to that. And if I, if I forget, remind me. But um I just wanted to come back. So it was the Astra Astounding Broccoli Boy, was it, the, the book? Yeah. Yeah. So um, what made you decide to write a book about a, 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 a viral pandemic? Mm. Um, I, mean, you, I mean, that's a long story, but it, like, it's about a boy who changes colour and it turns mm. out that this is a symptom of a... A respiratory, it's actually a respiratory right. virus, right. Uh, which is con possibly conveyed by cats. So in the book, it's called Killer Kittens. Mm -hmm. And it's because, I, I mean, I, I want to ask you privately about this, but I have a blood condition myself, uh, which makes me change colour when I'm under stress. So it just came from a very personal thing yes yeah about that yeah. And, and trying to kind of build a story out of it. And, and, and also like to take on those stories about, I, I kind of, I, I believe quite strongly and philosophically in, in human nature, in the goodness of human nature. I, do, I think the problem of why we are good to each other is much more interesting than the question of why we're bad to each other. So I did kind of want to take on that kind of contagion 28 days later type of narrative and see what would happen if you flipped it. And then and, the world and, became a better place. And it did. So so, so all this kind of uh, the, the community spirit and people working together and not, you know, uh, the society not falling apart that's how that was the narrative of your story was it yeah actually, i'm really really yeah. interested in that and i think that there's been kind of a lot of people making an analogy with war mm. and with the war of which the british feel dangerously nostalgic and misled about but still and i think at the end of the war one thing that people always like don't talk about is the fact that we threw churchill out and kind of rebooted society and Certainly for some length of this lockdown, it seemed to me that there was an opportunity here to talk about what could be different. You know, what could you do differently? What will we do differently? And certainly in the arts, there's a lot of talk about you can't, there's no going back. You know, certainly for theatre and for, for venues, there's no going back. So everything has to be reimagined. And mm. that huge kind of imaginative opportunity seems to be... I, I, at that moment feels to me like it's fading, but that might be just me. Yeah, yeah. I better answer this question. I can already see 20 messages from my brother. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what was the, the, the it was about um, government response and who they put up. And I think, I mean, I think you're right, Sally. It is really interesting how sometimes it's a minister, sometimes uh, they point to the chief scientific advisor, chief medical officer. I, but I'm never, I'm never put up by the government. I, I, you know, appeared in quite a lot of things, but um, uh, I'm not there representing them. And although I sit on an advisory committee, that's kind of advice that goes into the to the melting pot. So, um, uh, so I think if I answer the question, I think I have. But the the the, the role of the chief um, medical officer is is a really interesting one. Chris Whitty's a friend of mine. I was at uh, medical school with him about 300 years ago. And, and Sally, you, of course, have done a, a, a really interesting work with all the previous chief medical officers, I think. Is it the previous four? Um, yes. Or you yes, did I something have. with them. I mean, I'm, I'm, I hope I, but I know you've done stuff. With I have tell, one, us, yeah. tell us a bit okay. about that. Maybe I've got that wrong, but tell us, I know you've done stuff. Maybe you've analysed what they've done. Tell us a bit about that and how you think they might have responded in this outbreak. Yes, I mean, this goes back a long way in my, my academic career. But when I, I had a, some associations with Ken Kalman when he was chief medical officer in the 1990s, I did a piece at his leaving um, uh, uh, reception. And the new incoming chief medical officer, Liam Donaldson, came up to me. And he said, I'm really interested in history. 
um, I don't know anything about the role I'm taking on, which worried me a bit. <laughs> and he said, would, would you like to collaborate? And we, I'd really like to know what the previous 14 chief medical officers have done because the post was established in 1855. And I, was, I thought it was a brilliant opportunity. So Liam and I wrote a book together and I pulled it off the shelf earlier because I thought I love the colour cover. I spent ages. Oh, good. No, that's great. Fantastic. Kalagalulia, as they say on the Frank Thanks, Skinner absolutely, show. Absolutely, absolutely. It's now out of print, of course. Hold it up again. Just hold it up a little bit longer. I'm not sure everyone caught it. There you go. Great. Complete with stethoscope. And uh, with hindsight, I thought that was such the wrong message to send because the chief medical officer is not just about medicine. They are about health mm. and about promoting good health. So what I did in that book was to look at how previous CMOs had had problems, uh, whether it was pandemics, the 1918 influenza pandemic, which the chief medical officer didn't handle very well then, but also how they've had tensions with government over the years. And a brilliant example, I was, I've been thinking about this so much when I've watched the news reports, um, when you have um, either the Prime Minister or the Minister of Health flanked by his two scientific advisors. And there's a parallel here with 1954, when they were first announcing the link between smoking and lung cancer. And the minister then, Chuck called Ian McLeod, sat at a desk in front of the journalists. He had his CMO on one side, head of the MRC on the other side, and he read a report. And he was really reluctant to do this, I should say, because the Treasury didn't want people to stop smoking because they needed the revenue to pay for the NHS. And so he read this report. He said, I have a duty to tell you that there is an association between smoking and lung cancer. Guess what he was doing while he read the, read the statement? <laughs> yeah, not one, not one, <laughs> not four cigarettes. He chain smoked, lighting each from the last. And the impact was just, you know, the next day wasn't front page news. It was page four of the Times, tiny article, and it had no impact on people's smoking habits. So that's, that's where you get the government probably misusing their scientific advisors. And that's just one example, I think, of, of quite a long pattern of that sort of activity. So are you saying... Like how deliberate do you think that was, Sally? Do you think he's just addicted and he couldn't stop smoking? Or do you think that is, that is a piece of theatre? You know, where, yes, I've got the, yes, I'm doing everything you told me to, but I can smoke, the, the smoking is a signal to undermine it. I think it's a, I think it's a very deliberate signal. And he probably was, you know, that level of addiction that he wouldn't even have thought about it. And then, yeah. you know, 1950s, 80% of British men smoked. Yeah, yeah. So it's introducing really quite a radical idea. And just quite, it, yeah. And just quite interesting that idea of like pre allowing the information to get out, but doing so in bad faith. Because another kind of story that we've not talked about, but is very prevalent, is uh, is the conspiracy theory thing, where Tom takes his walk in the mornings to High Town. Mm -hmm. Someone's written. I don't know if you've seen this yet. They've written on the tar tarmac, you know, c fake COVID figures to control your data and. Like so that, and, and when a government acts in a kind of bad faith way, when they act in a conspiratorial manner, that produces conspiracy theory, and that into that is part of the why there is that lag of two hundred years between getting rid of smallpox, is that the real power of an, the narrative and policy is for these big scale things. You need consent. You know, you need people to believe in it, and you need people to buy into it. And if you do that in bad faith, then they won't buy into it, and they won't lock down, or they won't or you'll get anti-vaxxers or, or whatever. Yeah. You know, the story is the persuasion, isn't it? And the persuasion is almost as important as the technology. Yeah, it is. Now, I'm just going to pause there because we have promised that we will take some of the questions from those listening in. So uh, let's feed some of these in, questions and comments, and, um, and then we will carry on with our own discussion. But I'll be in trouble if I don't do what we said we'd do. Um, question Tom's, about... Hmm? It's Tom's brother, look. <laughs> no, Bruce, Bruce is all right. Bruce is he's, he's happy now. Um, question is uh, about um, community. Sally, you talked about the community study and going into houses. Somebody wants clarity. Do you mean physically going into houses or, or is it via this kind of messaging? Uh, they will be physically going into houses. They'll be sending in um, uh, 
people who are fully equipped in, in PPE to take uh, biological samples, blood samples. Um, but then there will be follow-up questionnaires that were done by post. Um, so we're absolutely, I want to reassure the person who sent that message in that we are abiding by all of the regulations when it comes to accessing yeah. individuals for our studies. Thank you very much. And a question for Frank about um, church closures. You've talked about communities and um, obviously churches closing has a big impact on that. What are your thoughts on that and how are people getting around that? Well, that's been so interesting. I mean, like the church closure thing obviously impacts on older people quite hard because that is where, I mean, personally, that's where I've kept an eye on the old people, you know, apart from the religious aspect of it, that is where there are old people who I, I take care to kind of say hello to and make sure they're there and wonder why they're not there. So that that's kind of increased isolation. Uh, and also the churches generally usually have some kind of outreachy thing. So like I used to do the, I used to collect from our two bakeries, Waterfields and Satterthwaite's, and take them into the homeless shelter on a Friday. Obviously that had to stop uh, because the bakeries themselves closed down. So there's all that kind of spin-off thing. You know, church is not just about worship. Uh, from the worship point of view, that and this is another thing that's maybe not within the, the, the portfolio of this, but like church worship went onto line completely seamlessly. Like it was kind of very moving to see these very often quite elderly priests grasp the technology, take it online and a kind of whole different kind of imaginative relationship with the technology happening almost straight away. Very, very, very quickly they adapted to that. And that was very moving, but kind of interesting as well, because I've got very, you know, as someone who's trying to write, you know, everyone, anyone, anyone who writes has a very conflicted relationship with technology because on the one hand, it's this amazing tool. And on the other hand, it's this terrible, terrible distraction that gets you sucked into this daily circus is very very hard to control and i'm very very interested to hear what people think will change in our relationship with technology because obviously this has been in one sense an incredibly benign life-saving tool that we're using here and now and on the other hand it is the great propagator of all the conspiracies and a great kind of stirrer of the pot of anxiety uh, it's, it's it's both a cure for isolation and a kind of promoter of isolation at the same time yeah, I, th I think it's really interesting what will what will go back and what will continue. I mean, Sally, what do you think? Our, our, our working practice has changed. I mean, for me, as a because I do some lab work, although my people who work with me would say they try and keep me out of the lab as much as possible, but I do at least have an excuse to come into the building. I, you know, in theory, many people could forever just work at home on the end of a computer, but do you, what do you think will happen in the future? Do you think people will come back onto you know, normal working practices? I hope there will be a part, at least a partial return. I, I really value having that direct face-to-face -face contact with individuals. I find Zoom quite a challenge. Um, I think it takes more, more concentration to do meetings, particularly big meetings by Zoom, because you've got that slight disconnect between pictures. You've got people looking directly at you. Um, so I would like to see a, a mix, a hybrid. I really enjoy being on campus. I, and I think for universities, it's important that we have those, those opportunities for the, the sort of serendipitous interactions. That's how you spark new ideas, new research projects. And that's how you have the, the, the most um, exciting conversations. But yeah. maybe that's something that we will be able to, to do through Zoom and, and other technology. What about for you, Frank? I mean, you, as a, as a writer, you spend a lot of time at home anyway writing. Um, what will change in the future, do you think? For me? Mm. Gosh, I, I mean, I'm very, very comfortable with the whole Zoom thing in, in the sense that I hate being away from home. And, and I, I love being able to talk to schools that are far away. That's been a really wonderful experience for me. Um, although it's left me very unprotected. Like I said, geography has been a great barrier, mm. like a great defence for me. It does leave you very vulnerable. And it's much harder to protect your writing time. Um, from a religion point of view, that's that that's ha has been a pain, you know, because like it, it, I, I don't mean a pain in the, the bum. I mean like it's been mm. painful mm. because the centre of it is is sacrament and it's about presence and it's about physically being somewhere. You, you it, like the Allegri Miserere was only ever played in the Sistine Chapel. If you wanted to hear it, you had to go to Rome and hear it. And there's still that, you know, you can't really have the full experience without being there. And that's true socially as well because. 
All I know from going to mass on a Sunday is the counter in the corner. I don't know who's there or how they're looking mm. or if they're feeling sad or mm. or looking great. You know, I, I, I don't have that kind of the community in the definition that we were talking about at the beginning where you have to rub along with people who are in a different social class, different political ideology, different outlook, different age group from you. I think the parish has kind of almost been the last bastion of that kind of community in Britain, because as we've sort of separated into gated suburbs, demographics and, and settled into that, the parish has been a great challenge to that. And of course that goes, although it's quite funny, like I know that like there is a counter in the corner and I know that my mum goes to mass in, um, like that's the thing we're saying like go to mass in like yeah. i've been going to mass in edinburgh whereas yeah. my mum's been going to mass in in overbury street in liverpool and i know that she looks at that counter and talks going oh a lot of people came late or oh they left straight they left very <laughs> early and it's like well actually you know that. You know, she's just watching that her eyes up in that corner all the time watching the counter going. <laughs> Now, what about you? We were talking earlier about um, fake news, conspiracies, et cetera, et cetera. Do, how, does, how does social science address some of these issues? Does it, does it need to? You know, how big a problem is it? Is it just people having a bit of fun or, or are there people who seriously believe some of this and, and therefore it really is a challenge for us to overcome this pandemic? I think it is a serious concern and one of my colleagues, uh, Mark Green in Geography, is doing a, a brilliant project um, looking at misinformation during the COVID-19 pandemic and they're using uh, Twitter and Facebook feeds so um, we have um, have access to some of that data uh, and we're, we're analysing it to look at patterns about when these sort of stories get started and how they spread and whether they're more common in certain sections of societies and communities. So mm -hmm. it is more worrying. I think if you look back to, to the last big pandemic that we had in Britain and people always go, oh, 2009, and it wasn't. It was uh, 1968, um, Hong Kong influenza, mm. when we had an excess mortality of 80,000. And people have just completely forgotten about it. Yeah. And that's partly because at the time, there was very little media interest or coverage of it. So people got on with their lives. They weren't looking for those explanations. Um, and I think a lot of the fuel for the, the sort of misinformation, the fake news, is because people just want that constant buzz from hearing something new all the time. And they'll, they'll go and they'll follow, uh, you know, Twitter feeds, down all sorts of holes that will take them to places that, that probably aren't very reliable. That's so interesting. That's really interesting. I mean, I think the pandemic has put pressure on a lot of things in a way that's sort of revealing. So it's put pressure on race and class and, in ways. But I think one really interesting thing is that at, at a point at which a lot of mainstream politics seems to sort of almost dispense with the idea of truth, truth has suddenly become extremely important. <laughs> you need to know. And I, I feel that nobody does know really what's going on. And that kind of febrile atmosphere of distrust that's created is, is a curveball. That's amazing about 19, about Hong Kong flu. I completely, one thing that Camus says in the, in the plague is that plagues and wars happen all the way through history. But every time, and lots and lots, I mean, I've become very aware of this, you know, there are a lot of plagues in history. Every single plague comes as a surprise. It's like, whoa. This is never what the hell. This yeah. is the end of the world. It's yeah. like, well, no, it happened ten years ago. You know, it's like, what are you talking about? Like, yeah, you and it and it was and you've forgotten. Like that's how not the end of the world it was. You know, um, and this is like, there's a it feels apocalyptic in theatre, and you can figure that. Like in Shakespeare's time, theatres were closed for six years because of the plague, and we've still got the you know we've still got all those plays. So I mean, talk, people talk about hurt. you talked about theatre earlier in the arts. Do you, do you think? Um, you know, clearly some places are closing and struggling and you, 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 you said, you know, this might be a game changer and things may not come back or, or do you think they'll just operate in different ways in the future? I think there's an opportunity completely to reinvent things, which is very, 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 very exciting. Uh, and the Shakespeare Theatre did reinvent itself, but in a way that looking back now, we probably wouldn't like, you know, it became less the globe, plebeian, big crowds and more the kind of court elite theatres. Uh, I think, you know, it does need to be addressed. I think, you know, there's a lot of, we, we need to talk about what's at the end of that rainbow. 
you know, the rainbow in the window. Well, what is over the rainbow? Is it just troubles melting like lemon drops? You know, we kind of need to give some thought into what it could be as that war generation did, you know, and came out, out of that it war did. and so, built yeah, the, the NHS. The war generation certainly did. I, I don't know if after previous pandemics and, 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 and 68 was a pandemic, but maybe wasn't quite so catastrophic or so changing. I guess the better example is, is the 1918 flu pandemic. I don't know, um, Sally, I don't know if you know, if after that pandemic, there were the kind of changes like we saw after World War II, you know, the kind of big societal shifts. Were there similar things after the 1918 pandemic? Well, there were, but they were, they were mixed up with the end of the First World War as well. I think mm. what's, what's interesting parallel with 1918 is that we had some similar situations. So we had a really, dis, well, not really dysfunctional, a, a disjuncture between levels of authority. So we, we had no one national government department responsible for health. We had some powers with local authorities, but not all of them. Um, there wasn't a clear chain of command and people didn't know quite who was in charge. I think we have seen an element of that again with, with this with this pandemic. Um, I think epidemics are really useful litmus tests of what the underlying tensions are in society. Yeah. And what mm. worries me about this one is, is how it is going to exacerbate the existing inequalities that we have, particularly within Liverpool. I think that's, that's a very worrying um, possibility. And that's one aspect you're studying at the moment through some of your social science research. It is, yes. I mean, we've, we've got a long-standing uh, research agenda around health inequalities in, in Liverpool in the North West. But it's, it's the things that people don't think of. Um, it's the impact on, on education for individual children. If they don't have that access to technology that, um, that we expect all children to have these days, it's the lack of access to school meals. Mm. So there's, there's, there's such a wide impact, health impact, from an epidemic that goes beyond just the impact of the virus on an individual body. Yeah. Let me just, we're, we're, I'm told that 40 minutes is the ideal time for a podcast and we're at 40 minutes. Perhaps we've got two minutes left because we started two minutes late. But <laughs> let me just, I mean, we've had some fantastic questions and comments in. Um, and uh, what we will do is um, at the end, we can, we can capture them all so that we can potentially get back to people. Let me just share a few with you, with you both and with everyone else that's listening. Um, Covid's rekindled an interest in trust in experts, which was eroded in the run-up to the Brexit referendum. That's from Carol. I don't know if I'm meant to be giving people's names. I should have checked. First um, names is fine. First names is okay. John says, we've never been so vulnerable to pandemics, but we're also capable of handling it. Absolutely, Frank, says Lorna. What could our world be? I'm excited, especially by a rethink of higher education in the context of societal yeah. developments. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you like that. Um, from Peter on Facebook, how can schools better educate our children to filter out fake news? There's mm. clearly surely some work to be done there, yeah, isn't there? Yeah, huge, yeah. Um, Misinformation's coming from the press. They seem accountable to no one. Well, that was always the way, wasn't it? Uh, from John, one of the government and its acolytes, excuse uh, no, I won't go down that one. I mean, I think <laughs> I also I also didn't check with my controllers. I think I've had a bit of a steer not to be too controversial and political. We could do that another day, but there are probably people better placed to to manage such a podcast than me. Although I did. I mean, your comment, Frank, about Churchill and, you know, after the war, he was um, ditched pretty promptly. And you, you mentioned the uh, the Dominic Cummings effect on the way people have viewed the whole thing. And I, personally, my, I, I think you're right in that sense, that it has changed a little bit how people feel. Yeah. Whereas everyone was trying to follow the rules. Um, certainly, if people's instincts tell them otherwise, then they, they may be behaving a bit differently. Well, but, it just seemed very similar to the smoking minister. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah, really interesting parallels. But you do wonder whether at the end of this pandemic, uh, you know, just as uh, the Prime Minister during World War II was thrown out soon afterwards, you, you do wonder what the future holds. Um, but we're keeping away from politics, or at least hard politics. Um, question about how you feel uh, this has impacted, for both of you, on the mental health of the population, and, and young people especially. Um, I mean, Frank, you're interacting with schools. Yeah, and also individuals. I, I've been doing these creative writing lessons online, on Instagram, and I kind of pointed them away from mm -hmm. artistic achievement towards mental resilience. They were all about, you know, exploring your house uh, and, and dealing with sort of the fact that, you, you know, where you are can, can always be wonderful and interesting if, you, if you're awake to it. So that encouraging creativity 
is is a way of encouraging mental resilience as as well as I'm not interested in like people having careers in arts. It was more about kind of helping people think about their situation in different ways. It's a great line in Rilke. It says that if you think where you are is boring, that's because you haven't woken its soul. And so those lessons were about trying to get kids to to waken the soul of wherever they were. And they've been hugely. Uh, I mean, like the numbers were great, but but also the kind of the passion and the response of those kids were, it was really interesting, you know. So creativity yeah. does definitely have a role to play. Okay, thanks. Great. Well, that we we are at our forty minutes now. Bang on. So, I will I will uh, call our discussion to an end there. At least the podcast will. I think we can probably we could be discussing for another few hours. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But, I mean, thank you. Thanks both very much for joining me. I have some closing comments here. Uh, firstly, I need to let everybody know that um, this has been recorded and when the recording is available, uh, people will be emailed so that they can share it with their friends. We'll be doing this again, I think. I mean, I had said if it was a total disaster, we won't do it again, but it feels to me like it's gone okay. No, those two are shaking their heads. <laughs> <laughs> Rubbish. <laughs> um, uh, next Wednesday, we have a slightly different event, uh, but uh, it's called Liverpool Responds and it's organised by the University Centrally with the Vice-Chancellor, um, the Pro-Vice-Chancellor for the Faculty of Health and Life Science, Louise Kenny, and also, I think I'm on that one as well, discussing how the universities responded to COVID. But uh, for the moment, I will thank you both for, for, for coming on. It's been, it's been very interesting and great fun. I thank all the audience for listening. And if I uh, was technologically able, I would now play out the closing music, but I don't think I am. Uh, but maybe one of the technical people will could do we that. Hum? Hmm? We could we could oh. all hum instead. Yeah. Oh, here we are. He's going to have a go. Let's see if the music comes in.